you know, you found found skeleton. Skeleton. How would you tell people that person? You personally, how, how would you tell them? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure it's not this. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Once again, there may be some cicadas. When last we left off, Carl Kirby was busy telling us how bad it is that someone who wasn't a professional rushed to publish paleontology findings, then he said that for some reason this is a problem for paleontology as a field. Next he's going to tell us about how wrong he is about Australopithecus afarensis. Take it away, Carl. Now, one more ancestor. The most famous of all the ancestors, Lucy. What are we going to do? Lucy was so special, she didn't just get her picture on Google. She got an animated GIF. So this is big time. What are we going to do? My guess is that he's going to blatantly lie. And, and, and there's plenty of pictures of Lucy. I mean, Carl, there you go. That's an evolutionary ancestor right there, walking like a human, looking like an ape. I mean, from the neck up, that is one ugly woman. I'm just being honest with you, OK? I can't even begin to tell you how f***ing weird it is that Carl judges paleontological reconstructions based on how sexy he finds them. Like seriously, what the actual f Carl? You had to go and make the whole thing uncomfortable. From the neck down, looking mighty human except for when she had a bad hair day, it was all over her body and that's not a good thing for a lady, I'm just saying. Wait will double down on the weird cross-species sexual objectification. Hey, fun fact, even in hominins, reconstructions aren't there to turn you on sexually. We have a whole other genre for that. It's called pornography. Maybe Carl would be better off looking at that, as it's clearly what he's hoping the painting he's showing everyone would be. What are we gonna do, Carl? That's a evolutionary ancestor if I ever saw one. I don't know. Accept science and then go to an adult bookstore? What's the actual evidence? Let's go take a look at it. Here's what they have. Now there's two important points I wanna make about Lucy. Number one, Lucy wasn't even a she. Lucy was a he. I'm not sure how the sex of Lucy actually matters, but let's pretend that the controversy about the sex of Lucy was still ongoing. Fun fact, the sex of most fossils is never determined, and while that does suck for purposes of not being able to easily study sexual dimorphism or monomorphism in the past, it doesn't mean that the fossil ceases to have all significance if it's not of determinable sex. <laughs> yeah, her bones, they figured out after 40 years of study that Lucy wasn't a she. Two Swiss scientists figured out that she was a he. And those Swiss scientists suggested a new name. They suggested Lucifer. They didn't find out that she was male. They concluded it, and the conclusion was not accepted by the consensus of the field, because the evidence of Lucy being female was stronger. Turns out the use of Lucy's pelvis was found to be inconclusive since the reason that human females have a wider pelvis is to help in the birthing of infants with gigantic heads. But this was not a concern in Australopithecus. But the genus had wide sexual dimorphism in total height and mass for males and females, with the males being substantially bigger and heavier. And Lucy was one of the smaller morphs, meaning she was almost certainly a female. Again, not that this really matters, as even if she were male, that would do nothing to topple her place as an important find of a transitional species in or very close to the human lineage. If you want to read more, a paper explaining the non-pelvic sexual dimorphism of Australopithecus can be found in the description. Oh yeah, and it's almost a quarter century old, so we can tell Carl here is really keeping up to date with the literature. Now I did say amen to that because this is a set of bones that's been used more by Satan to light us than any other set of bones going. I swear, if it weren't for the casual dress and the fact that the church looks more like a theater than a church, I would assume Kirby is leaning into the stereotype of the uneducated anti-intellectual rural Protestant pastor. And yes, there are churches out there that see a lack of education as a positive when looking for a pastor. And point number two, oh, she's 40% complete. Remember the quotes that we read? Oh, they're only fragments. There's so little information to study. Very true, but not Lucy. Oh boy, we have 40%, not true. There are 206 bones in the adult, ape, and human body. If you start counting the bones up here, feel free, um, you're not gonna find 40%. The vast majority of bones in the human body and ape body are in the hands and in the feet. No one ever claimed that 40% of her individual bones were found. It's 40% of the whole skeleton that was found. That's not misleading. That's Carl intentionally misunderstanding a pretty obvious thing and assuming it should mean something that, as far as I can tell, no one has ever meant or even inferred. And if you look carefully, you're going to see that they didn't find any hand or foot bones for the specimen Lucy. Now, this is an important point. Please stick with me. Lucy is an individual within a family. I am an individual within the human family. Lucy 
they found her bones and her bones did not contain any hand or foot bones, but they did find hand and foot bones from her supposed relatives. Hey, you know what? He's basically the only young earth creationist I've ever heard acknowledge that we do, in fact, have hand and foot bone anatomy for Australopithecus afarensis. Now, let's see how he inevitably ruins this small win. So, 40% uh, complete? That's not true. If you start counting the bones, oh, you're going to get probably about 20%, which is still good compared to just pieces of a bone. I mean, bone fragments, like next to nothing. Yep, Lucy is a pretty great find, even if you do just naively count bones like someone who doesn't know what he's talking about. Why the exaggeration? It's not an exaggeration, it's just scientists not thinking about pastors intentionally misrepresenting their findings. Now, one more point I want to give you though. This is kind of interesting. One of the bones that they did find actually turned out to belong to a baboon. So here's the neural arch of a Therapithecus, a human, and an Australopithecine. Not exactly the easiest thing to distinguish, is it? Also, what conclusions of science were directly based on this partial cervical vertebra? Oh, right, none. And the same paper confirmed that the rest of the skeleton is indeed a aphorensis. In fact, let's quote from that paper Meyer et al., shall we? Our additional analysis confirmed that the remainder of AL2881, that's the official designation for Lucy, vertebral material belongs to A. afarensis, and we provide new level assessments of some of the other vertebrae, resulting in a continuous articular series of thoracic vertebrae from T6 to T11. This work does not refute previous work on Lucy or its importance for human evolution, but rather highlights the importance of studying original fossils as well as the efficacy of the scientific method. And of course, that paper is linked in the description. If the fragment really does prove to belong to a baboon, he says, we can cut Don Johansson and his colleagues some slack. Okay, cut him some slack. But it still doesn't prove that this thing is a human ancestor. True, finding one misidentified bone that, quote, does not refute previous work on Lucy or its importance for human evolution doesn't prove that Lucy was a human ancestor. In fact, if you read the literature, you'll find that she's not really represented as a direct ancestor anyway. It's like I said in the last episode when I was talking about looking at remains from the time and place of my distant ancestors. Chances are that the actual remains I look at won't be my direct ancestors, but part of the population they lived in. So I can still learn about my ancestors through the proxy of their likely close kin. You know, I, I, I just find this interesting. Look at the skull pieces that they have there. You count them out. You know, you've got just a few skull pieces. I want you to see the reconstruction from those pieces. This is what the reconstruction looked like. Now, let's listen to one of the guys who worked on those, uh, these fossils to see what he says about the skull of Lucy's species. As we uh, assemble larger pieces from smaller pieces, joining them together, we begin to get a fairly impressive picture of a species that has a very ape-like face with uh, big protruding brow ridges. Very ape-like. So according to the individual that worked on the reconstruction of the skull of Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis, just means southern ape. Well, it means southern ape from afar, hence the specific name afarensis. It was very ape-like, big protruding eyebrow ridges. I want you to see the reconstruction. When you go to the Smithsonian, you see this reconstruction and look, those eyebrow ridges aren't that big. I mean, it looks human. I don't know what Carl has been smoking between church services, but that does not look like any Homo sapiens I've ever seen. And yes, compared to a modern human, those brow ridges are enormous. And further, putting up different angles so it looks like the one on the left has a bigger head when instead we're just getting a bigger cross section is misleading, although perhaps not intentionally so. That seems to me a perfectly reasonable reconstruction, although I'll admit I'm no paleoanthropologist. Where did the human features come from? From the fact that apes already look a lot like humans, and so it's easy to see human features when looking at any ape. From the skull that is very ape-like? Yes. No, from the individual that made the reconstruction. Take a listen to what he said. I wanted to get a human soul into this ape-like face to indicate something about where he was headed. So I'm guessing the only human-like feature that can't be found on the skull is the eyes. Because when people talk about seeing a human soul, they focus on the eyes. Because eyes and eye tracking are such a big part of how humans interact subconsciously with each other. Excuse me. The evidence was a very ape-like skull, and you know he's headed somewhere. She. But the idea that Australopithecus as a genus is headed somewhere is not based on simply Lucy's skull. It's based on the whole collection of fossil hominins, which form a smooth gradient between Lucy and modern humans. 
This is like saying, oh, you can't tell where that car was going, you only saw it for a few seconds when it stopped for gas. All while ignoring that I had a GPS tracker on the car, and I watched the whole journey happen through a series of GPS pings. To get a banana is about the only thing that you know he's headed to do. Humans, like most monkeys, like bananas. In fact, they like them so much that the modern banana is a human invention, and there were no bananas where Lucy lived when she lived there. You put the human features in there. And by the way, did you notice one of the features that were there? Oh, did you notice the eyes? Take a look at the eyes. The one feature on here, other than hair, which is decidedly not much like a modern human, that seems human and wasn't directly inferred from the skull? Okay, let's look. You found seven pieces of a skull, and you know that she had human eyeballs? No. Yep, this reconstruction, like all reconstructions, is speculative in some areas. You don't know that at all. Apes don't have whites around their eyes. They don't? Then why does this human have white around the eyes? What about this gorilla? Or this chimpanzee? Or this orangutan? Seems like all species of apes, at least sometimes, have white around the eyes. Heck, even dogs do to better communicate with humans. How do you know that Lucy had whites around her eyes? They don't. They stuck a human eyeball in there, and that is nothing more than deception. So be careful. Do not be deceived. No one knows when white scleria became predominant in the human lineage, but it obviously happened at some point. And while I actually do think that putting those eyes on AF forensics is probably not the most parsimonious reconstruction, I can't say that it's wrong. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting picture, you know? Uh, looky there. Can you, can you take a look at the look on Lucy's face? Is that a proud woman or what? Is Carl just not aware that apes in general have expressive faces? It's a big part of ape-to-ape -ape communication. She's looking at her man and boy, she should be proud. Look at the pecs on that guy. I mean, good to know that Carl is being equal opportunity about his weird sexual objectification of extinct organisms. And look over here. Here's another lady. She's waving up at the trees. Hey, you got any bananas up there? And look at the look, look at the face on her child. I mean, those are human features. Is this whole thing just that Carl doesn't know about eight facial expressions? Here, look, here's a chimpanzee that's happy, and here's one that's angry. And here's a baby gorilla reacting to a cold stethoscope. And here's a human baby doing the same thing. I'm really not sure why he thinks that pointing out deep similarities between humans and apes is doing his contention that they're all completely separate creations any good. And if you want to see a future Fortune 500 CEO, this is a man with a vision for the future. You got all this from seven pieces of a skull? First, here's a pensive looking chimpanzee. Second, remember that Carl said he knew that Lucy was just one member of a larger group and that other specimens were known that filled in other parts of the anatomy that was missing on Lucy. That's still true. So no, these reconstructions aren't based on just Lucy, let alone just her skull fragments. And you think we Christians have a problem? No, not Christians on the whole, just the science dying ones, which again, is the minority. Take a look. These are the, some of the supposed relatives of the human race. Notice the further back you go, the darker you are. I actually don't see that very well. What's more prominent to me is that the older species here seem to have less saturation in the skin tone, which is very obvious in Bronze Man up at the top there. But hey, you know what? I've already talked about human and pre-human skin color, and by I've already talked about it, I mean I asked Gutsy Gibbon to do so. So here's her from an earlier video, and of course if you're not subscribed to her, then what the heck is wrong with you? Erica here, or Gutsick Gibbon as some of you might know me. Human pigmentation is perhaps one of the most adaptive features of our species. From the far north and the far south to indeed the center of our globe, we can see quite a disparity. Darker skin at the equator is, to put things quite simply, much more advantageous in order to keep one safe from UV radiation, while lighter skin, which is seen to the north and to the far south, is more advantageous for facilitating the absorption of vitamin D in a location where perhaps it isn't quite common. But which pigmentation came first? This is a fascinating question with very interesting implications just on where humans may have originated. Thanks to modern paleoanthropology, we do know that humans are a part of an ape-like lineage that started in Central Africa some 7 to 12 million years ago with an ape known as Sahelanthropus chadensis, or perhaps an organism not quite it exactly, but certainly very much like it. 
the finding of all sorts of different human lineage or human lineage adjacent species all across Central Africa can be corroborated with our genetic information. We know that the oldest human mitochondrial haplogroup is that known as L0 and sees its origin also in Central Africa, some 150 to 200,000 years ago. This is again corroborated with some very interesting later paleoanthropological finds that see the origin of both archaic and modern, anatomically modern speaking, Homo sapiens in the same location. So it's certainly starting to look like Central Africa is where we saw our beginnings. And with these three lines of incredible evidence, we know that the story probably looks a little something like this. After losing our fur, humans being exposed to the immense heat of living in equatorial Africa, and indeed adapting to sweat quite a bit, had to figure out some kind of way to protect ourselves from UV radiation. Now, evolution being the tinkerer, we would see a selection for those with darker skin pigmentation as it would have protected them from the UV radiation of the angry and sweltering sun. So dark skin would have been very in vogue as far as survival goes living in Central Africa. As our species migrated up and out, we would see all sorts of different adaptions to the far north getting a bit paler or maybe moving from there back to the south and indeed getting darker once again. Our origin form, though, was indeed very dark-skinned, and just gives us another excellent reason to underscore why racism is both stupid and whack. Now, notice, uh, now hear me on this. Hear me on this, please. I am not saying that evolutionists are necessarily racist, but I will say this. Evolution is a racist philosophy. You mean evolution? That thing that determined that actually races don't really exist is racist? Okay, buddy. Because... Evolution teaches, as we've said before, that ape-like ancestor evolved into the black folk. Well, it is true that all of the first humans had dark skin, since dark skin is an adaptation to high sun exposure, and they lived in arid and semi-arid areas near the equator. Dark skin there, without lots of clothing, is a biological necessity. But also, the first humans to get to colder places had dark skin at first, too. Light skin was a fairly recent adaptation in humans, and it didn't happen at the same time or in the same way for all currently light-skinned populations. I'm not sure it was racist about saying that humans who have more UV exposure have darker skin. I wonder what color skin Carl thinks the first humans had. Some of those black folks ate fish, spurred brain development, got smart, moved north and turned white. What? Fish? I have no idea what he's talking about. And no, it wasn't the humans with more brain development that went north, or south for that matter. And H. sapiens didn't originate in South Africa, but rather East Africa around modern Ethiopia. The first humans in Eurasia weren't any different from their immediate ancestors in Africa in terms of biology. Carl here seems to be simply making things up. The further back you go, the darker you are. That is racism. It's also not really what's happening. It's that the closer you are to the sunny parts of the tropics, the darker you are. I mean, look at a map of modern skin tone in native human populations. Notice how it basically matches how much sunlight the people there would be expected to get? So if the cradle of humanity is in Ethiopia, then what would we expect except that the first humans were dark-skinned? And since human ancestors were all living in similar environments to that, at least broadly speaking, they too would need dark skin. Like, does Carl think we should just pretend that Homo habilis was a light-skinned animal that was just riddled with melanoma and constantly sunburned? What kind of sense does that make? God said we all go back to one man and one woman. And what was their dominant skin tone? I presume it was probably something reasonable for where they lived, right? Like I doubt they were pasty white like an Irishman who stays inside all the time. Is it racist to say that there is a particular skin tone that Adam and Eve probably had based on where you think they lived? I don't think so. Even if I know that there were no two first ever humans. So be very careful with this stuff, guys. There are implications that you may not even notice, but they're there. Oh, believe me, I noticed the implication that hominins have a balance their production of vitamin D with the chances of UV-induced skin cancer. Here's another piece, watch this. You see the jaws right here? Oh my goodness, on the far left, that's a chimp. On the far right, that's a human. And in the middle, there's Lucy. She is halfway in between apes and humans. Yep, you got that not quite rectangular, not quite parabolic shaped tooth row. Pretty sweet. How's he gonna screw this one up? She's the missing link, she fits the bill. What are we gonna do? 
Here's what we do. Let me draw a red line down here, horizontal line. And now all we're going to do is I'm not going to change the size, the shape, the structure of the jaws. All I'm going to do is change the placement, the bottom of the molar on the top of the red line. And let's move it up and move the human jaw down. And I'll ask you a question. Does it look so transitional anymore? Um, yes, because the point is the shape of a tooth row, not the size of the palate. Even modern humans vary in palate size, but the Australopithecus tooth row is still closer to the parabolic than the chimpanzees, and it lacks a diastema between the lateral incisors and the canines, and it has reduced canines compared to the chimpanzee, all of which makes it intermediate in form between the chimpanzee and the human. Things don't cease to be transitional because you rearrange them in a picture. This is nothing more than a chimpanzee jaw, but if you push one down and move one up, oh, it looks like it's somewhere in between. It is not, it is a chimpanzee jaw. Sure, if you just ignore all the important aspects of the jaw and just focus on basic size, I'll grant you that in that one dimension, it's about the same as a chimpanzee jaw. But like I said, there's still a lot that indicates it's not a chimpanzee jaw and that it is transitional between the relatively basal jaw of chimpanzees and the highly derived jaws of humans. But now let's look at some of the reconstructions of the outside of Lucy. I mean, you have reconstructions from ranging from chimpanzee all the way to orangutan, but all of them depict one thing in common, Lucy walking upright like a human. Why? The curve of the spine evident from the sacral ribs, the shape of the pelvis, the angle of the femur, and the relative length of the forelimbs and hindlimbs, the shape of the knee, you know, all the stuff that normally indicates bipedality. Oh, and what's that? Oh, right, a ventral foramen magnum. Granted, that's not from Lucy, but it's from other specimens of Australopithecus afarensis, which remember, Carl knows existed. Because they found totally human footprints. Nope, Lucy was known almost immediately after being found to be bipedal. Although, not exactly how good at being bipedal she was. The Laetoli footprints we're being shown weren't discovered for another few years. Plus, Laetoli footprints are in fact not identical to modern human footprints. For one thing, they're small. For another thing, they are considerably more flat-footed than modern human footprints. But hey, don't believe me, check out Raiklin et al. 2010, which is linked in the description, and which has some really neat 3D analysis of the footprints compared to other footprints, including those of modern humans, which allows a careful analysis of the biomechanics, which shows that while the animals that made the track certainly walked in a very similar fashion to modern humans, it was not identical. And the thing is, I could have picked dozens of papers that all have a similar conclusion. The Laetoli footprints are human-like, and enough so to fool a layperson to thinking they just are Homo sapiens tracks, but closer examination shows interesting differences, which incidentally makes the tracks intermediate between humans and other apes who sometimes will walk on only two feet. Totally human footprints found in Tanzania. This proves that Lucy walked upright. Uh, by the way, how many foot bones did they find for Lucy? None. None. But remember that time Carl said this? Lucy is an individual within a family. I am an individual within the human family. Lucy, they found her bones, and her bones did not contain any hand or foot bones, but they did find hand and foot bones from her supposed relatives. So let's take a look at one of them. This is the foot of Dakika child, a juvenile Australopithecus afarensis. Fun how the bones are all in a row, isn't it? It looks a lot like the kind of foot that would be able to make the Laetoli footprints. And even though there's no segue, I just want to remind everyone to subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying the content. And they know that Lucy made this. Why? Oh, because of the dates. The thing is, Carl knows better than this. He admitted as much himself. He knows Lucy is a single member of a species and that other members of her species existed. No one is suggesting that Lucy made these tracks. That's extremely unlikely. The claim is that they were probably made by her con specifics. As at that level of strata in the region, A. Aparensis is the only currently known hominin. That's a different topic that we can go into sometime. But guys, these are totally human footprints. Funny, because White and Sua 1987 is a meta-analysis of the then existing literature on Laetoli. And while they know that there was not yet a consensus about the prints, every single author in the field had noticed that they were not anatomically consistent with the identification of Homo sapiens. Weird that, isn't it? Again, there's a link to the sources in the description. You have something that doesn't have any foot bones and you know that that thing made this thing. I'm going to say that they know that it didn't and I'll prove it to you in a second. Stick with me. It's nice how Carl here is accusing essentially all of the professionals in the field of lying while himself knowingly lying about the state of the fossil record of Australopithecus afarensis. And I know he's lying about it because he's contradicting his earlier acknowledgement that we have more than just Lucy to go on about this species. 
This is what they say about these footprints, though. Make no mistake about it, they are like modern human footprints. If one were left in the sand of a California beach today and a four-year-old were asked what it was, he would instantly say that somebody had walked there. He wouldn't be able to tell it from a hundred other prints on the beach, nor would you. The external morphology is the same. This is a totally human footprint. I see your non-peer-reviewed book from 1990 and raise you a third peer-reviewed study. This time, Raiklin et al. 2008. Of course, there's a link in the description. Raiklin and company concluded that in order to get reasonable walking speeds, certain aspects of the gait had to have similarities to chimpanzee bipedal gaits, meaning that the footprints are, once again, not simply modern human prints. What's that now? Two original papers and a meta-analysis of a large number of more, all concluding that Carl is wrong, and one book that he can clip two sentences from to indicate that he's right. I feel like I'm winning. Come with me to the Denver Museum of Natural History, take a look at this exhibit. Some feet are made for climbing, some for walking, so you got your chimp, you got yourself a human. And then right in between, they say this, and some for both. Hold up! Hold up indeed. First is the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, not natural history. Although it's basically a natural history museum. I've been there, it's really nice. Second, I do not remember this exhibit, and it's a bit concerning that it doesn't look like he took a picture of the display, but he's showing us his possibly inaccurate depiction of it. And I can't find anything from the museum like this, even though you can find photographs of basically every exhibit. I'm not saying that for sure Carl is making this up, but right now that does seem more likely than this being an actual display. Third, no museum is likely to use the name Lucia as synonymous with her species. And further, the middle foot looks more like that of the Tong child than that of the Takika child. But the Tong child is a different species of Australopithecus or at least it hasn't been referred to any currently known species of that genus. The, the footprint that they found in Tanzania is totally human. Oh, is it time for a fourth paper that disagrees with Carl here? Okay, how about Hatala et al. 2016, which concluded the prints were made by something that was more similar to a human, but still significantly different from either human or modern chimpanzee. And yes, I plan to just produce new papers saying that the prints are not made by modern humans, every time he says they are. Maybe this will be the last one. Maybe I'll get a bunch more. I don't know, I'm watching this with everyone else. Why do they show Lucy's foot halfway in between? You can't put a totally human footprint with a foot that's halfway in between. It doesn't fit at all. Near as I can tell, Carl is the only one claiming Lucy's foot would have looked like that, and by extension, that the feet of A. afarensis would have looked like that. But also, since apparently Carl still thinks these are human footprints, how about we take a look at Tuttle et al. 1991, who show that while there is some overlap in proportion with always unshot human footprints, the footprints fall outside the range of human footprints for the most part, and indeed are intermediate. How do they know that uh, Lucy was halfway in between like that? They don't, because she wasn't, although the Dakika child was. Lucy's locomotor apparatus was closer to human than chimpanzee, or that of the common ancestor of both. They don't. Matter of fact, that's even wrong and I'll prove it to you. When you uh, used to go to the St. Louis Zoo, they had an exhibit of Lucy there that showed L Lucy with a totally human foot because those footprints were totally human. Weird how Meldrum et al. 2011 reports that the Laetoli footprints reveal some midfoot flexibility and a different arch structure to that of modern humans. Of course, link is in the description. I mean, a little nair would solve the rest of the problem, but that's a totally human foot. How many bones did they find for Lucy? Remember, none. But Carl, remember when you said this? Lucy is an individual within a family. I am an individual within the human family. Lucy, they found her bones, and her bones did not contain any hand or foot bones. But they did find hand and foot bones from her supposed relatives. Yeah, Dakika Child would like to have a word. We have to know that. None. Not a single one. What were the bones, though, that they found from the relatives for the foot? How were they shaped? Were they shaped like a human or were they shaped like a chimpanzee? Well, the Tom child was intermediate and the Dakika child was much closer to human, consistent with the Laetoli footprints. And the Dakika child, unlike the Tong child, was in fact a member of the same species as Lucy. Interesting. Extinct humans in Tattersall, I found this in uh, their book and he says this, in keeping with Lucy having had long and strongly curved finger and toe bones as do chimpanzees and orangutans, Let's finish that sentence. Quote, in keeping with Lucy having had long and strongly curved fingers and toe bones as do chimpanzees and orangutans, 
Schmidt's reconstruction also emphasizes the long arms typical of an arboreal hominid. So, to the surprise of no one, A. afarensis spent plenty of time in the trees. If you want, I can give you the research that shows that Lucy's relatives had fingers and toes more curved than a chimpanzee. More curved. Please do, Carl, because that's going to be a citation needed from me. So when you find totally human footprint, there is no way that Lucy or her relatives made it. None. Except again, they're not really modern humans, are they? In fact, some of the tracks, like Laetoli A3, actually do show a significantly divergent big toe that falls well outside the range of human variability. Of course, that's just according to McNutt et al. 2021 from Nature. Again, for the seventh time, link in the description. You can go do the research to prove this for yourself. I just did do a bunch of research, and it says that Carl is full of <laughs> Weird, that. I want to take you to a TV show that I know is still being used in some of the public schools because when I showed this opening right here, I had a young man raise his hand and said, hey, we just watched that in science class. And I said, what did it show you? Oh, that we evolved from apes. I think we need to look at it closely, all right? Uh, in Search of Human Origins with Don Johansson. Don Johansson is the guy who discovered Lucy. So in this program, PBS Nova made, they just talked about Lucy. Let's listen to it. And by the way, if you'd like to get these clips, all you need to do if you're uh, doing the apps, go to your app store and type in Reasons for Hope. Just spell it out, Reasons for, F-O-R, Hope. And you can download our app, and on there you'll find the Lucy clips so that you can use them. Notice how he doesn't want people watching the whole thing, just his cherry-picked clips. Super intellectually honest there, Carl. Definitely not, you know, a cultish level of information control that just stepped right off the pages of the Byte model. Because I want you leading tours through the zoos and the museums and you see this exhibit, I want you to show the videos that I'm going to show you here. We can call them Dunning and Kruger tours. Because when you see these things, they do not support what we're being told that it actually supports. So let's take a watch. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Okay, now remember this. In order to know that you have found a missing link, something that is the common ancestor between apes and humans. Nope, a transitional form does not need to be the direct ancestor of a modern group. Get better, Carl. I know you know this. You need something that walks like a human, but looks like an ape. In order to walk like a human, you have to have knees like a human, you have to have hips like a human. And what did Don Johansson just say? Uh, let's just read. He said that the knee looked human. Did they find a complete knee for Lucy? And the answer is no, they did not. Couple things. Carl, remember when you said this? Lucy is an individual within a family. I am an individual within the human family. Lucy, they found her bones, and her bones did not contain any hand or foot bones. But they did find hand and foot bones from her supposed relatives. Yeah, there are knees known for A. afarensis, but also apes have this cool thing called bilateral symmetry. If you find a bone from the left side of the body, then you know what the bone on the opposite side looked like, too. So if they found Lucy's left femur, which they did, including the distal end, and they found her right tibia, which they did, including the proximal end, then guess what? You can just mirror one of those bones, and now you know the angle and shape of her knee. In fact, at this point, I'm going to link in the upper right a video by Paleologos, a young Earth creationist who has done work with fellow creationist Todd Wood, and who has talked about this topic. He has strongly concluded, and for good reason, that A. afarensis was a biped. Normally, for this kind of thing, I'd link to Guts at Gibbon, but this point is so crazy that even well-informed creationists know what's wrong. Let me take you to a source that really doesn't like Christians very much, and this is what they write. The skeleton called Lucy does not have an intact knee, so my question is how do they know that it looked human? Carl should read the next sentence. A different isolated knee fossil was found two or three kilometers away. And this is Talk Origins, which is one of the big sources I used when investigating creationist claims as a kid to see if what I believed actually made sense. Turns out, no, it did not. And that's why I'm not only not a young Earth creationist, but I do these videos debunking them. As far as them not being fans of Christians, let's take a look at the table of contents. I'll read subheadings without the main heading just to save time where there are subheadings. We have where to start, navigation, updates, the evidence for common descent, what is evolution, the process of evolution, General information about creationism, arguments of creationists, organizations, questions for creationists, biology and the living world, fossils and paleontology, the age of the earth, young earth arguments, flood geology, radiometric dating, complexity, information and entropy, physics, 
astronomy and cosmology, religion and philosophy, social issues and history. And finally, we have books. Okay, let's see. Only one of those, religion and philosophy, seems like something that would even bother to address Christianity directly rather than science. So let's look at the article Chance from a Theistic Perspective by Lauren Harsma, copyright 1996. It's linked in the description from the Talk Origins archive. Feel free to read it yourself, but let's see the conclusion. In closing, I should note that McKay and Polkinghome do not wish to restrict God to this sort of subtle action. Both authors write about miracles, but that is outside the scope of this FAQ. The point of both authors for this FAQ is that random events, whether described by physics, evolutionary biology, or any other science, are in no way an obstacle to God's providential action, quite the opposite. They are the only way in which God could exert providential care. So this source, that is no fan of Christians, actually has a way in which Christians can accept both science and a theistic worldview? Going out of your way to be friendly is a weird way to show that you're not a fan of someone. They do not know that Lucy's knee looked human. They did, though. He continues on, he said, but the shape of her hip didn't. Okay, what did, her shape, what did the shape of her hip look like then? Because if she's going to walk upright, it's got to be curved like a human. So how was it curved? When initially discovered, it seemed to look like that of a chimpanzee. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilization. Let's be clear about this. The iliac bone, that's the bone that makes up the crest of the hip, was so pushed into the sacral vertebrae that the pubic symphysis, the part of the hip in front of where the left and the right halves come together, would have been unfused by several inches, making walking on any number of legs impossible. So it was completely impossible for the shape as discovered to have been the shape in life. All right, we gotta break this down. This is what he said, just making sure I'm getting this right here. Her bones are broken after she died, then fused together in later fossilization. I am not trying to be crude or crass. But when you die, are your bones fusing anymore? Oh, so Carl doesn't know how lithification of sedimentary rocks occurs. Okay, well, let's go over it. In sedimentary rocks, the grains are the sediment that was transported to the site and deposited there. But also dissolved between the grains can be various cementing agents, such as pyrite, gypsum, or calcium carbonate. As time goes on and the water dries up, these fall out of solution and cement the grains together. This also occurs with fossils, which are fused into the surrounding matrix, and can be fused directly to each other by such cementing agents. This is taphonomy 101. It's the kind of thing that's so basic that most scientists wouldn't feel the need to explain it this explicitly. Obviously, grains of sediment fuse to form sedimentary rocks, and the things in them are fused too. How else could it work? No, the decay process kicks in. So how in the world do you break these things and they fuse back together? Cementing agents. That doesn't make any sense. And then he said this, her hips look chimp. So the implications are that originally she had hips like a human. Something happened to cause them to look like a chimp. What happened? I'll let him tell you. After Lucy died, some of her bones lying in the mud must have been crushed or broken perhaps by animals browsing at the lake shore. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. Can we talk? Here's the story. Human hip Lucy is taking a stroll down by the lake. She just happens to die. Actually, she probably fell out of a tree and perhaps directly into the lake and died on impact. The body lays there. All the flesh rots off. And then a deer just happens to come along and step on her hips, crushing her hips. And then the hip bones fuse back together, no longer looking like a human, but now they look like a chimp. More or less, yes. Are you kidding me? Please just think about this for one second. Okay, I thought about it for a second. And given the absolute impossibility of the original condition reflecting life condition, yeah, seems to check out. Animal dies down by the lake shore. How long does it have to lay there for all the flesh to rot off? Dunno, but here's something fun. A hip can be crushed with flesh still on it, so it doesn't matter. A while? Don't you think in the wild that that thing is laying there and rotten, that scavengers aren't going to come along and start eating on it and dragging the bone parts all over the place? Yeah, hence why it's only about 40% complete rather than 100% complete. 
The, the fact that they found all of these bones together in one place shows that it was covered up water by rapidly. Do we have an explanation? Yes, but that's a different talk. I hope it's not the flood because virtually all young earth creationists would say that these bones are post-flood. And, and then he said this, they fit together so well they were in an anatomically impossible position. I love when they start throwing the big words around and trying to intimidate people. Oh, it's anatomically impossible. Why? Because they're curved like a chimp. No, it's because of the pubic symphysis, not because of the preconceived notion that Lucy had to be a biped. It's not like non-bipedal apes aren't known from the fossil record. I mean, Proconsul is a basal ape that no one thinks was a biped. It's not like a quadrupedal ape would not have also been an important find. Why lie about this? And also, does Carl have a way to square the resulting anatomical impossibility from assuming that the disposition of Lucy's hip, as found, was a life condition? I really doubt it. And she walked like a human. Excuse me, if she was a chimp, her hips should be curved like a chimp. Then there's nothing anatomically impossible about it. Yeah, and the shape of the iliac crest isn't what made it impossible. This whole thing is an argument based on a straw man that also includes an appeal to an unevidenced conspiracy across the whole of paleoanthropology. By the way, could it fit any better than so well? Listen to this next quote. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. You heard that. The perfect fit was an illusion. Yeah, in life, bones don't just directly contact each other with no space. They have things like cartilage and interstitial fluid between them. When you get bone-on-bone -bone contact, that's the kind of thing that results in knee or hip replacements. What can you do with something like that? The perfect fit showed she had hips like a chip, but that's an illusion. We don't accept that. And then all was not lost. There's hope. Look, the name of our ministry is Reasons for Hope, and we do. We place our hope in Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of that. Cool. I'm not asking anyone to be ashamed of their hope in Jesus or to change their belief in him as Christ. This isn't an atheist channel. It's a religiously neutral channel that counters pseudoscience. It just so happens that a particular subset of Christians like to put out a lot of pseudoscience. What I am asking is that Christians take the science seriously and not lie about it or strawman it. Fortunately for me, most of them don't, and some of them who don't are regular guests on this channel. But you've got to understand that he's also placing his hope somewhere. There's a really big difference between one's hope of eternal salvation and hoping that one can successfully reconstruct a shattered pelvis. I don't know if Owen Lovejoy has a religion or not. Seems like, in common with me, he didn't see his religious views as germane to science. Every one of us place our hope somewhere, and I'm praying that you're putting your hope in Jesus Christ and not this mess. I'm pretty confident that no one is hoping to have eternal life based on Lucy's hip. And if they're using it on its own as a reason not to believe in God, I also think that's silly. There are actual arguments against various God concepts and against the existence of any God, but none of the serious ones in philosophy center around evolution because it's irrelevant to the question. I want you to see the technology that was used to rebuild Lucy from chimp hip to human hip. This ought to be good. No, you know what? Even though I can't see you right now, I want you to do something for me. If your eyes are still open, I want you to close them. I want you to hear the technology. I'll tell you when to open them. It'll only be about four seconds. Close your eyes and take a listen to the technology that was used to rebuild Lucy. You can open your eyes. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. I hope so. If you take a Dremel and cut out the parts that you don't want to be there, it better look like you want it to look like. Not the parts he didn't want to be there, the parts that were not original. And then he reconstructed it according to present contour lines and with the recovery of an anatomically possible pubic synthesis. If Carl wants to show fraud here, which is what he's implying, then he's going to have to one, show what the original configuration was, and two, show that Lovejoy knew his reconstruction was wrong. 
By the way, do you know what video you don't see when you're standing at the Smithsonian looking at the reconstruction? You don't see these unless I'm there or you, I pray, are leading towards through there in the future. You, this is what you see. And, and there she is. There's Lucy standing upright with hand bones and foot bones. Yeah, and all the other bones she wasn't found with, but which were filled in by other finds in the same species. And Carl's knows those were found because, remember, he said this. Lucy is an individual within a family. I am an individual within the human family. Lucy, they found her bones, and her bones did not contain any hand or foot bones. But they did find hand and foot bones from her supposed relatives. After this, he just gives some story about how he led a tour group through a museum. I'm cutting most of it out, but I'll jump back in when he says something worth responding to. Look, non Christians, they have a religion. It's called secularism. It's called atheism. Good to know that Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Baha'i, Jains, Buddhists, etc. are all faking it, and they're really atheists. We need to know why we believe what we say we believe. We need to be able to give an answer for the reason for the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. Having a reason is a good idea. Basing it off of lying about fossils is a bad idea. Look, when Mr. Crottenmaker wants to say that we don't want to set aside our preconceived ideas and follow the observational evidence with logical, testable conclusion, that is not the case. You could have fooled me. You see, I've got a millstone waiting for me if I'm given false information. That's what God tells me. Well, since Carl demonstrably is, maybe he should stop. Millstones are pretty heavy of necessity. Here's the truth about Lucy, using their sources. And by the way, did you notice this entire episode, the fossil episode, we use the secular sources. No, he misused them, as I showed both in the last series and this new one. We're not running and hiding. We're taking their stuff and critically evaluating it. As a rule of thumb, if you are a layperson in a particular field and you find that you're at odds with the vast majority, or in this case, more or less the entirety of the experts who spend their whole lives studying and adding to that field, you should consider that it's hugely more probable that you miss something and don't know what you're talking about than that you're the one who noticed the thing that they all missed. This is from the Houston Museum of Natural Science. They got the actual bones, Lucy's actual bones, brought them over to America, put them on display, and made a study guide for the people that were going through there, for teachers that were taking all the students through there. I got a copy of that study guide, and this is what it says on page 20. For 20 years, Lucy was thought to be the oldest human-like fossil ever found. Even though older fossils have been found in the past 13 years, Lucy remains the benchmark by which all other discoveries are judged. Lucy has become a household name. But is she a human ancestor? Let's go up to the top of the page and read. For many years, Lucy was thought to be a direct human ancestor, but we now see her as belonging to a separate group of hominids from those which became our species, Homo sapiens. What does that mean? It means that like with most transitional fossils, Lucy represents the morphology intermediate between basal forms and later more derived forms, but that she was probably not directly ancestral to those modern forms. But this still means that she is a direct confirmation of the predictions of evolutionary biology, and at best she can only be accommodated by young earth creationism by post hoc rationalizations, but she was certainly not anticipated by those who follow those ideas. Lucy is not in the human lineage. She's not. Probably not, no. Funny how this study guide acknowledges that, then points out the same thing I did, that that is not the important part of being a transitional form. Don't trust me? Let's go to another source. Uh, Jerusalem Post. Israeli researchers. Lucy is not a direct ancestor of humans. Ah, yes. The rigorously peer-reviewed newspaper. The Jerusalem Post. English edition, of course. I don't think Carl here knows any Hebrew, biblical or modern. Let's go look at one of those phylogenetic charts that we talked about in the other episode on fossils. This shows, oh look, this shows, yeah, do you know what it shows? Do you see the bold line, actual evidence? Do you see the skinny line with the question marks? Yep, because the relations between taxa are always going to be at best a hypothesis, unless we can get essentially complete data sets, which becomes essentially impossible once you're talking about fossil taxa. Also, the way that phylogenetic analysis works is it's literally impossible to recover an analyzed taxon as ancestral to the others in the study. When you make such a tree, you're asking how could these taxa most likely be related to each other by common ancestors not included in the analysis. So even if we could say that Australopithecus afarensis was definitely the ancestor of Homo sapiens, you couldn't get that as an output from a phylogenetic tree. If you look, you'll see Australopithecus afarensis, that's Lucy. 
Notice that she is no longer connected in, leading on to any other line. Yep, as standard. And as a matter of fact, the missing link, if you go to the right, that's apes. If you go to the left, that's humans. The missing link tying the apes and the humans together, if you look very closely, you see two question marks and a skinny line, which means they have nothing. Weird, because it looks like we have Aurorin tucanensis and Sahelanthropus chidensis, although tucanensis is spelled wrong. 50 to 88% of the younger generation walking away from the Lord Jesus Christ because they think this is science. It's not. It is, and the problem isn't that kids found out what science is. It's that people like Carl keep telling them that the Bible precludes science being right. At least that's a problem if you want Christianity to be true. And as far as this channel is concerned, I don't have a dog in that race. And that's it. That's his last point. Well, thank you for going on this journey with me. It feels like a direct continuation of my last series about Carl Kirby, and to some extent it is. Well, if you liked this video, please remember to hit like. If you didn't like it, hit dislike, and tell me what you didn't like in the comments. Please share this video with anyone you think would find it interesting. Subscribe to the channel, and make sure to turn on all notifications so you're always notified when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Ben Tovend, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Landon Knoll, Yepetus, Mabdi Babdi, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is. And perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.